My name is Clifton Hicks. This is uh, Steve Casey to my left here. We were both uh, privates and C Troop of the 1st Squadron of the 1st U.S. Cavalry Regiment. Uh, we're going to, Steve here is going to help me out on some of these things. Before I begin, though, I just have a brief statement I'd like to say. For the infantrymen, scouts, and tankers of C Troop, 1st Squadron, 1st United States Cavalry Regiment, there are a few words which can express my admiration. I can merely say that I love them with all of my heart and that I would never have made it home alive without such a worthy and courageous host at my side. These were men who risked everything for a cause which they believed was just and true. They left behind them their families, their friends, and their lives. And in fact, they endured the unendurable. They did this not for greed or jealousy or hatred, but for the sake of love. And for that, they are beyond judgment. And I am no judge, and I have not come here to pass judgment either on my fellow soldiers or the officers who once commanded us in war. I'm simply here today to pass judgment on war itself. Uh, first item, April 2004, free fire zone in the Abu Ghraib neighborhood of Baghdad. During Operation Blackjack, my troop was specifically instructed by our troop commander, a captain, that a particular sector we were moving to recon and force was now considered a free fire zone. I specifically recall him telling us that there were, quote, no friendlies in the area. And then he specifically said, quote, game on, all weapons free. Now, it's important to understand uh, these are not unusual orders. Uh, these are not even unnecessary orders. And in uh, the nature of war, and this particular war, uh, these, are, these are necessary whenever a situation gets unusually dangerous or confused, which happens quite often, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, upon arrival in the area, we found the streets, uh, you know, besides being littered with wreckage of, uh, you know, vehicles, who knows if it's a civilian vehicle or an enemy vehicle, there's no way to tell, uh, but wreckage of vehicles. Uh, there wasn't a single building in this neighborhood that hadn't had a hole shot through it or uh, something explode inside of it. This place was totally destroyed. Uh, the streets were littered with numerous human and animal corpses, uh, not just men, uh, but all manner of humanity. Uh, I personally saw no military gear or weapons of any kind on any of the bodies that I came across. I personally did not fire my weapon on this operation, but I do know that other members of my unit embraced the weapons-free order by firing, for example, <laughs> by firing indiscriminately into occupied civilian vehicles and at civilians themselves, using both personal weapons such as rifles and uh, cruiser vehicle-mounted weapons such as machine guns, uh, coaxial machine guns of various caliber. And uh, Steve, would you want to elaborate a bit yeah. on some of that? Again, my name is Stephen Casey. Um, I was deployed with Cliff, obviously, at this same point. Um, we were not One together. Second, Steve. No, no, he's, he's good. He's okay. Well, here, just use mine. Okay. Sounds good. Let's start from the top again, please. I'm Stephen Casey. Um, I was in the same unit as Cliff. Um, in this one particular event, he's talking about the free fire zone. Um, he was in uh, what we could call the rear for a little bit, um, and I was in a forward platoon uh, doing operations on the streets. Um, and we were all ordered, it was free fire, no friendlies. Um, due to the fact uh, there was a rise in violence as we were trying to leave and go home after our year, um, we were April of 2004. Uh, we were scheduled to go home, but due to a rise in violence, we had to remain and, and we returned to the Operation Blackjack. Um, uh, we went to uh, the city where we were supposed to secure and patrol. Uh, one of the first thing that I noticed is that the uh, several buildings had been bulldozed by American engineering companies. Um, to, and it flattened and piled everything from rubble and vehicles up on the side of the road and set them ablaze. And uh, that's how they cleaned up the area and weeded out the bad guys. Uh, and we were sort of a cleanup crew after that. Um, and we, uh, I witnessed several uh, different occurrences where people took advantage of the, th the free fire order. Um, specifically, um, over 20 different uh, vehicles were disabled. I witnessed um, personal weapons being fired into the radiators and windshields due to the fact that these vehicles were coming 
up the correct side of the road that we were going down the wrong way. Um, our orders at this point in time were to have one vehicle on each side of the highway and ensure there was no one on the highway that, besides us. So with all the hand waving you can really do from a vehicle and those who didn't turn around, uh, unfortunately were um, neutralized one way or another. They did the vehicle, there were shots fired into the windshields, the radiators, um, well over 20 different times I personally witnessed. Um, and there, I, I don't really, uh, I never came to, to be able to justify that. Um, I personally never fired at these uh, and used the, the free fire order. Um, but there was a lot of collateral damage, I, no combatant damage that I can even recall um, at that point in time by the, the people I was with. Um, and actually, um, I don't know, I, I have some pictures of the actual marketplace after it was um, bulldozed to the ground. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to get those up or not, but maybe not. Um, however, there is footage, picture evidence of this. Um, I think that's, that's really all I'll say about that. Uh, it was later estimated, later reported to us by our platoon leader. We, me, Steve and I were in separate platoons. He was a scout. I was a tanker. But my platoon leader later reported to me uh, that some whiz kid somewhere had estimated that between seven to eight hundred enemy had been killed on that operation. And uh, as you just heard, and I'll, I'll agree to that, and, and I'll agree to swear to that to the day I die, I didn't see one enemy on that operation, but seven to eight hundred of them got killed. Uh, judging from what I saw on the ground, I'm willing to swear under oath in all honesty that while many enemy combatants were in fact killed, the majority of those so-called KIAs were in fact civilians attempting to flee the battlefield. And in that example, just because they were on the right side of the road and we happened to be on the wrong side of the road, uh, they had to pay for that. Um, I'd like to also briefly say that it's common knowledge among the men of my squadron that the unit which we relieved in the summer of 2003, which was 3-7 Cavalry of the 3rd Infantry Division, had also been given free fire orders when they first entered Baghdad in the spring of that year. Many of the men in 3-7 told stories of massive civilian casualties and in some cases direct orders to inflict such casualties. Uh, they claimed as a matter of fact that they literally, literally, this is what they said almost to a man, that they had killed everything and everyone who dared to show themselves. That means animals, people, anything. Uh, and this is what happens when a conventional force such as the U.S. military attacks a heavily populated urban area. Um, they put us in a situation, you know, we're not bad people. Uh, you know, we, we were there because we thought it was the right thing to do. We were there because we thought we were going to make things better. We were there because we thought these people wanted us to be there. And then you show up and you realize that there's a whole bunch of people there that want to kill you. And guess what? They look just like the folks who don't want to kill you. So are you going to sort them out and figure it out? The only way to ensure your survival is to make sure that you put them in the dirt before they put you in the dirt, to put it bluntly. And I'm sorry to say that. Uh, in November 2003, uh, to speak more on the Spectre gunships, uh, an AC-130 gunship attacked an apartment building, uh, a complex of five buildings. There are photographs of that. Um, if somebody could project uh, my photographs, the AC-130 photographs, uh, there's just maps and such, um, satellite photographs, so you can get an idea. Uh, most of our post was safe from enemy direct fire attack. Direct fire is small arms, rifles, and things like that. Uh, indirect fire would be mortars and rockets, which they could lob over a wall. But direct fire, we had a pretty good perimeter as far as that, except for this one spot. And there was a, uh, a length of road that was perhaps a quarter mile distant, uh, maybe about a mile away from our barracks. And on occasion, uh, uh, people would shoot from this building, and it was, uh, you know, it was supposed that there was spotters for mortars that were calling in mortar fire on our post in this building. Um, so there were a handful of active insurgents who were trying to kill Americans at, out of these apartment buildings. Uh, but what is really interesting about the apartment buildings, they, they were regular apartment buildings occupied by families. Uh, and we knew this. Every time you drove by, uh, you know, people would be out on the balconies getting fresh air. There was laundry hanging off of every balcony. Uh, there was constantly people all over. And this place was a heavily populated, uh, you know, so they were all in there squatting or something. Uh, 
Nobody really cared, you know. Yeah, sure, you know, they shot at us a few times. They spotted mortars from there. You know, nobody ever got killed from this stuff. We didn't really care about it. We just were careful around that area. Uh, but one day, uh, as was told, this is, you know, the official story that was told to us by our chain of command was that the squadron commander, who was a lieutenant colonel, had rode by there in his personal Humvee and that they'd made the mistake of shooting at him. And, uh, and either that night or the next night, uh, they, they sort of went around and told everybody that uh, at about 10 o'clock that night, they were going to put on a show for us. Uh, so this AC-130, which Hart described pretty well, shows up and uh, doesn't just strafe or shoot a few rounds here and there. Uh, it comes up and launches a, a, a sustained attack on these buildings. It circled numerous times, expended quite a bit of ammunition. Um, Steve, do you have the quotes of what the Lieutenant Colonel said? Before you move on, I want to make sure that we are advancing the photos along with the testimony. So, Jeff, if you could uh, get up the images that uh, that uh, Cliff and Steve uh, have up for us, because there are images of the satellite imagery. So I just want to um, find out if we have that, and then um, we can have them describe those images if they're available. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Um. Lieutenant Colonel Williams, who was the colonel whose personal Humvee was purportedly shot at, um, did an interview with CBS that, that, that afternoon before it happened. Um, and he is quoted as saying, if you are trying to send a message by firing and harboring yourself inside of an area like this, we want to send the message right back that you can be reached. We will find you and surgically remove you. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but um, Spectre gunships are, are used. They're not a precision weapon. There's no precision to it, as there is with surgery. So to have him compare that is a little odd. Um, but that's not the route he took. Um, he didn't go into too much detail, apparently, of how it was going to be done. Um, but I have video evidence that was unfortunately too long uh, to bring. Uh, but I do have video evidence of the, of the airstrike itself. Um, and the most disturbing part, because um, you can't see a whole lot from where we stand, it's about a couple of kilometers outside the gate, um, is that the parties on the rooftops, our roofs were set up in a semicircle around this, this post and building after building, and they were, everyone was told to grab their chairs and popcorn and jerky and go on top and watch this, watch this thing go down. Um, I was there. I, 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 I probably hooped and hollered as well. Um, there were pe people quoted on the video um, saying, higher up NCO saying, can you hear Haji die? We don't have Zone 5 anymore because they just blew the out of it, et cetera. Um, and lots of cheering, lots of jeers, and good times for the, uh, for, the, for the show that they had they put on for us that night. And at the time, you don't really take in. You know, you know there's civilians there, but that's what we're supposed to do. So I uh, never got a true body count out of it. Uh, we never went to inspect the rubble afterwards. Uh, but I can tell you that it happened. Uh, and he can tell you that it happened. He was on a separate building, a different vantage point, watching the same show. So I don't think I have much more with that. And you, you, you gentlemen have a, a video of the house raid, is that correct? Yeah, actually, correct? I wanted to get to that. That's going to be at the very end. OK, That's at the end. Right. We're That's going to do just a couple more things briefly here. OK, you got uh, it. I mean, to wrap up the C-130 attack part, uh, you know, like I said before, I don't recall exactly how long it circled. These planes circle until they pretty much expend ammunition. Uh, but the main weapon it used in this raid was the 40 millimeter uh, cannon, which is an automatic loading cannon that can fire maybe, I don't know, around every, every half second or so. And it's a 40 millimeter round, which is like a hand grenade basically exploding. Uh, and it fired, I don't know, maybe 100 of these things. It was so many. Um, but I do recall it was the most destructive and devastating thing that I have ever witnessed before or since. And I would like to emphasize that this building, besides having a handful of people with, uh, with rifles who didn't really know how to shoot them and a handful of people who spotted for mortar tubes who didn't really know how to spot uh, and are very inaccurate, besides them, 
uh, it, was com it was packed full of innocent families. And it was in no way a legitimate military target. If you wanted to get rid of the guys in there who were actually doing something, there's different ways to do it. Uh, we worked with the 82nd Airborne who had plenty of snipers. We could have, you know, one sniper over the course of a week uh, could have solved the problem with zero damage to civilian person or property. One more thing to add. Um, another thing to add, um, the, another, one of their main objectives was to rid the, uh, the, rid the, the camp uh, of the mortar fire that we got almost daily. Um, and we were mortared from the day that we got there until the day we left, including the days after this target was destroyed. So um, he may have done some surgery or what have you, but um, I can assure you that I still have plenty of issues um, having when, when I, uh, with loud noises and et cetera by mortars landing daily on and around my, my post. And um, I, I just don't see any justification for it all, I guess. Um, and two more things about me before I turn the rest of my time over to Steve. Um, and 21st of January 2004, I have exact dates because I wrote about all this in my journal. Uh, a civilian was run over and left for dead by one of our Humvees. Uh, I'll be brief about this. It was a, we had been on a long night mission. We'd been out all night. We were tired. We wanted to go home and, and hit the rack. And uh, there had been a lot of shooting that night. It had been a real bad night, and we just wanted it to be over. We wanted to go home. Um, and so these guys ahead of us were coming in the gate, and apparently they, they ran somebody over. Uh, because we were so tired and we were so sick of it all, and we just wanted to go home and hit the hay, they didn't say anything. Uh, the staff sergeant, I mean, I, I know the guys in the Humvee. I know the driver. He's one of my best friends. And uh, the, the staff sergeant in command of the patrol was also a very close friend of mine. He's since been killed over there. Um, but the staff sergeant ordered the driver to continue driving. And then he also ordered everyone else on the patrol not to say anything about it. Not because they were afraid of getting in trouble for killing somebody, but because he didn't want to have to wait around and fill out a report. Or he didn't want to have to be inconvenienced. They just wanted to go home and go to sleep. And again, as I said in my opening statement, these are not bad people. These are not criminals. These are not monsters. These are people like any of us, but they're put in a, a horrible situation and they respond horribly. And uh, when you're around that much death, uh, running over some guy who was standing in the road uh, is not a big deal. What's a big deal is getting stuck and being separated from your cot for another two or three hours having to talk about it. So they didn't say anything. Um, and, uh, you know, we rolled up on them, and, and then, you know, we, we were kind of the, the idiots who stopped and called it up, and we got stuck out there for three hours. And after that, uh, you know, that never happened again. We made sure that if, if we ever saw anybody dead or anything like that, we just kept going, because uh, it wasn't worth the trouble. Uh, 21st February 2004, civilians killed and wounded by American small arms fire. Uh, during another nighttime patrol, and this was an unusually friendly neighborhood, uh, whatever that means, but this was a neighborhood where people came out and waved. People didn't really seem to hate us. Um, we're riding around and we hear an IED blast up ahead in the road and we hear AK-47 fire and then we hear M-16s firing back, which is our rifles. So we can tell that some of our people are in a fight up there. So we race ahead, eager to get into some of the action. Um, and uh, at the time, we considered ourselves unlucky because by the time we showed up, the fight was over. That's how combat is in Iraq, at least when I was there. It was very quick. Uh, you'd be out for nine, ten days straight, nothing would happen. And then for about eight seconds, uh, you know, all, all hell would break loose. And, uh, and then it'd be over. And then you'd just have the mess to pick up. Uh, but anyhow, there was a patrol of 82nd Airborne guys, and infantry guys, in Humvees. And they were packed in these unarmored fiberglass Humvees with machine guns pointing out on either side. Uh, they were attacked by maybe two or three insurgents. Who were, they were in an open field, uh, laying in, in sort of a ditch across an open field to their left. On their right was the civilian neighborhood, which was just housing for disabled military families uh, from the Iraqi army, as, which was our understanding. Um, basically, they had taken fire from the left. Some of the guys also had heard gunfire coming in from the right. So the whole platoon returned fire in both directions. And an 82nd Infantry platoon is, is no laughing matter. When they all get going, uh, that's a lot of automatic weapons. That's a lot of guys who know how to use them and have used them a lot. That's a lot of firepower going off on both sides of the road there. Um, so the firing stopped immediately. They sent some guys, ran out into the field, uh, didn't find any insurgents, uh, looked for blood trails, didn't find any blood trails, didn't find anything but some empty shell casings. 
uh, and then the rest of them had immediately dismounted and kicked in the door of this house that they had taken fire from, and they were going to raid the house and maybe catch the guy who'd been shooting at them. Well, what they found in this house, and this is a story that I've told a million times, and trust me, I do not enjoy telling it again. Um, when, when they kicked in the door of this house, that where somebody had been firing from them from the roof, what they found was uh, an entire extended Iraqi family, family, and they were celebrating a wedding. And uh, for those of us who've been in Iraq, or at least in Baghdad, you know that any excuse they have is a good excuse to get on the roof and shoot their guns in the air. Uh, it's, just, it's just a celebratory thing. We've all heard of celebratory fire being mistaken for hostile fire, and this is a uh, textbook case of that. Uh, old grandpa or whoever was on top of the roof cutting loose with his rifle because he was so happy that his daughter was getting married. Uh, meanwhile, this 82nd patrol in his front yard gets ambushed from across the road, and they return fire in both directions. And just to be brief on this, they, they hit three people inside the wedding party. Uh, one of them was an adult man uh, who was you know, slightly wounded. Another young girl, maybe 10, was slightly wounded. Um, but what really got me was uh, there was another girl who was maybe six or seven, and she was dead. Uh, she, I, I looked through the, I was in the gunner's hatch of the Humvee. I didn't get out and, and go inside the house, but I looked through the doorway, and that was the first time that I had ever seen a little six-year-old girl uh, dead, and not just, you know, you know, died of, uh, you know, drowning in a swimming pool or something. Um, she had been shot by a bunch of, you know, teenage American kids. Um, but so, but these things happen. Uh, this isn't, you know, people always say, yeah, well, that, that's war, and that is war, and that's especially this war. That wasn't uh, what's, what's interesting about this, because this happens every day. Little girls get killed by soldiers in Iraq every day, not because we want to, but just because it happens. Um, um, well, what happened was uh, the 82nd Patrol just sort of mounted up, and they rode off. Like, they just got the hell out of there. It wasn't their zone, it was our zone. So they left it with us. It was our responsibility. Once again, we got stuck calling this stuff up. We called it up to our tactical operations center, which we called the TOC, and we told them what happened. And, uh, and uh, basically, they told us to continue mission. They said, Charlie Mike, and that's military jargon for continue mission. And uh, so we, we, were, we didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, we just hopped up in our Humvees and rode out. And we didn't, have, we didn't even have a translator, you know, and we didn't speak Arabic. We couldn't even say sorry. You know, we just, we just hopped in our vehicle and rode off. Um, uh, this incident does not reflect negligence on the part of the soldiers directly involved, but it does illustrate the carelessness with which the U.S. military handles civilian casualties on the battlefield. We fired automatic weapons into the middle of a wedding party, wounding and killing several guests, and our only reaction afterwards was to drive away. And forget about it. And that's the thing. It's so difficult to get up here and talk about these things uh, for obvious reasons. But what's also difficult is that, like, right after this happened, we never talked about it again. We drove away, and we went back. We didn't even tell the other guys back at the post about this. This was just something that just, we just shuffled it back in our minds, and we thought, well, these things happen. And we didn't really think about it too much. And it was just lost. It was just forgotten. And then the war, or the occupation, I should say, dragged on. Anyhow, um, and I believe that was perfect timing. I'm going to yield the rest of my time to the other speakers. Thank you all. Lastly, I would uh, like to bring up something that uh, Lauren Hill here has brought up earlier, and that is the, uh, the raids and the, and the way the raids are conducted, and uh, usually the, uh, what we find, what, uh, what happens to, uh, to go on at the raids, and typically, um, in many, many instances, it is what the military calls a dry hole or whoops. Um, 
Several times this happened. Specifically, I have one event I would like to talk about, and I'll provi uh, be providing uh, some video evidence. Uh, it's sort of a truncated version of, of, the, of the raid, uh, but you can get the gist. Um, we, it was just a, a typical night raid. Um, it was uh, my platoon, a couple Bradleys. Um, we rolled uh, out to this, this house, and uh, the procedure for getting into the gate, because typically there were con concrete gate, uh, walls with uh, metal gates uh, closed and secured, so we would pivot steer the Bradleys into the walls to knock down the wall and tear down the infrastructure, the, whatever security infrastructure the, the person's home had, uh, sometimes even crushing the vehicles parked right behind it because uh, you can't see over it. Um, after doing that, uh, we drop the ramp and, and continue inside. Um, we go to the, uh, uh, the right door, which happens to be the wrong door. You can't get in the house for this door. There's actually uh, there's a deep freeze behind the house. So in all this chaos, everyone's screaming uh, we, and trying to find another way to get in. We go through the front door. Uh, and then we start hearing a lady screaming from the inside, uh, her and her children. Uh, ask, and we get to the door and bust the door in and take her and her children to what we call the EPW roundup area, which is where a couple lower enlisted soldiers would take the enemy prisoners of war, like this lady and her children, at gunpoint and hold them until the raid was complete. Um, so moving on through there, we, we entered their house and destroyed it. We rummaged through her personal effects that touched things no one should ever um, probably touch, looking for weapons, um, puncturing the walls, looking for soft spots. That was the new thing at the point in time that they were putting things in the walls. So that was our order. Um, so I guess to make this a long story short, um, we destroy this lady's house and we find nothing. We've, we've scared her to death and her children and come out, find out at the end of the video, you'll even hear, uh, we were off by a number. It was the house across the street, so. Um, and we didn't go, this is the really, I mean, at the time, I actually say, hey, we've got time, why don't we go? Um, however, we didn't go, we chalked it up, and as he says, Charlie Mike went home and maybe went to bed. So, if you don't mind, I would like uh, to show that video, if I could. It's pretty dark. The video is really not all that much. The audio is what's compelling. I'm So we're not we're not hearing the audio. Can you either turn it up and uh, play it from the beginning again, please? Can you, Steve or Jeff? Can you uh, roll it back to the beginning so we can get all the audio? And turn it up good and loud. It's kind of and play it again from the beginning, please. Yeah, this on it. Yeah, this on it. 
about shit. This woman saying that, oh, you was here, right? Yeah. What did she say? I, I didn't hear. The guy lives across the street. Oh, no. Let's go, let's go across the street. We got time. So, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about what happened in that scene? Yeah. Uh, that scene was uh, just kind of spliced together. Really, it's uh, sh the beginning and the end. Um, it was the entry um, after we went to the second door. Um, it was the wooden doors we kind of saw at the end with uh, all the locks that we'd beaten off. Um, and then we, of course, uh, drugged them outside at gunpoint and rounded them up and um, had them scared for... Uh, it was probably about a 45-minute ordeal. Unfortunately, I didn't have that much even video left on my hard drive at the time. Um, and the way it was videoed, uh, if you were wondering, um, on my vest, I had it um, corded. The camera was corded to my vest, and I just was able to pause it on and off to save memory so I could get bits and pieces instead of just all the beginning or all of the middle. So um, altogether, there's actually seven minutes of footage. Um, but what you just saw was the uh, bringing her out, uh, the initial um, clearing of the first floor um, and in the end once we realize there's absolutely nothing in the house we've destroyed her house um, with a with absolutely no respect for anything that was in there um, and then we get the uh, the word that whoops wasn't the right place so that being said um, I just do want to add that 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 is not an isolated incident um, I can speak on the behalf of the platoon I was with. That was not an isolated incident for us. Um, but I would like to say it, I, I can't blame the people who did it. I was one of them. We, we were all good people. We just uh, were in a bad situation and we did what we had to do to get through. So uh, for all those in the video and that I served with, um, like Cliff said, I have to thank them. Um, and I, uh, I hope they hear it. That's all I have.